Much has been said about former President Donald Trump's decisive win a week ago, and much more will be said as who voted and where is analyzed in the weeks, months, and years to come. With me now, sitting front and center, is Juan Gonzalez, the co-host of the national daily news program, Democracy Now! Juan, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here. So let's talk, what are your first impressions of what we saw last week? Well, it's clear that, that, that the United States electorate is moving more and more in the conservative and, and uh, populist right-wing d- direction, obviously. So it was, uh, uh, it was pretty stark, I guess, for most people who had hoped for a different outlook or uh, a different result. Uh, but I think the key thing to understand is there was a big drop in the vote and compared to, to four years ago. Uh, a substantial drop, and while President, uh, while Trump gained votes, he gained about, a, in, in the final total, total, because California still has about a million and a half votes to count, he will have ended up with about a couple of million more than he did, uh, than he got in, two, in 2020. But Harris dropped dramatically from Biden's totals, about probably five or six million votes. So really what happened was that, that a lot of people stayed home. Uh, more people than we than we had expected stayed home, and there was and most of the folks who stayed home were likely Democratic voters because the independent vote didn't change that much from 2020 to 2024. About two million people voted independent candidates. So really, what happened was that that a lot of people stayed home. Uh, more people than we than we had expected stayed home, and there was and most of the folks who stayed home were likely Democratic voters because the independent vote didn't change that much from 2020 to 2024. About two million people voted independent candidates. So clearly there was a major fall off in the Democratic uh, column. uh, And that's what has resulted now in now Republicans gaining not only the the Senate, control the Senate, the House, but also uh, the the White House as well. And you mentioned the the people who set it out, right? You cautioned voters sitting out this election because of a choice between two unsatisfactory candidates comparing the situation to the 1968 presidential election. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, back in 1968, people forget there was a, a president had decided not to run for re-election, Lyndon Johnson. There was another genocidal war occurring at that time, the Vietnam War, but the United States was directly involved uh, in the what resulted in the death of more than two million Vietnamese in that war, uh, and uh, and the the Democratic candidate was pro-war, uh, as we have had here with Harris continuing to support the Israeli invasion of, of Gaza, so that the result was that the, there was a, a disillusioned Democratic electorate, mostly young people back then, who refused to vote. I think when, uh, we, don't, we haven't had polls of those who didn't vote. We have had polls of those who did vote. Uh, but we're going to find out that a lot of young people decided that they didn't like the choices before them, and they just decided to stay home. And I think that that was a major portion of what happened in the defeat of, uh, of Kamala Harris. Now, do you think that's because of the Biden administration and, of course, Harris being part of it? Would it have made a difference, do you think, if Biden would have stayed in the race? Well, I think it would have made a difference if uh, Harris had tried to separate herself in some way or other from the policies of the previous administration. She didn't. Uh, she consciously chose to basically say, I am a younger, better version of, the, of what uh, Joe Biden was. Uh, and I think that that uh, ended up hurting her uh, dramatically. The other, of course, we've had a lot of discussion about the change in the vote. Uh, this, this electorate was much wider than previously. There was a big increase in the percentage of white women in the electorate. Uh, and, uh, and of course, the white women voted still a substantial majority for Trump. Uh, and then there was a drop in the African-American percentage of the electorate, in the Latino percentage of the electorate. And of course, in both among African-American men, but particularly among Latino men, there was a major shift uh, something I've haven't, and I, I've been studying elections back through the the 50s and the 60s. I've never seen such a sharp shift in the Latino community, uh, from about 36 uh, percent of uh, Hispanic men who voted for Trump four years ago to 55 percent of Latino men voted for Trump. And I, I looked at some of the local Chicago figures in Little Village. In Little Village, Trump's percentage uh, of the vote jumped from 13% four years ago to 32% 
uh, this year. That's a major, major shift uh, a lot in of, the Latino a lot of the, community. A lot of it has been credited to the economy, inflation. Do you think what, what drove Latino men in particular to vote was, was, was that factor? Uh, I think that's part of it. I think misogyny is a part of it. Uh, there's still a, a considerable male chauvinism and uh, within the, uh, the Latino community that saw Trump as a strong male figure. Uh, but I also think that increasingly the Latino community has had many more uh, uh, class divisions, the class composition of the Latino community has been changing. It's no longer the working class uh, poor of Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, and Dominicans who came in the 70s and 80s. You're seeing increasingly middle class Latin Americans coming to the United States. They have different perspectives and different views, especially when it comes to when they hear the word communism or socialism, they immediately decide, oh, they've got to oppose those candidates. So I think we're seeing a gradual class divisions developing within the Latino community, in addition to the misogyny uh, and in addition to the economic uh, pressures that people were feeling, mm -hmm. that is basically allowing the growth of a, a right-wing and fascist movement. Mm -hmm. And of course, it, the United States is not alone. The same thing is happening in Germany, the same thing is happening in France, the same thing is happening in England, uh, in the Netherlands, in all of these countries, you're seeing uh, a big uh, anti-immigrant uh, a phobia and also an in increasing uh, direction of the voters going in favor of authoritarian strongmen throughout all of the industrialized world. It's been reported that former White House advisor Steve Bannon amplified a message by the far right podcast host Mar uh, Matt Walsh, who on X texted, now that the election is over, I think we can finally say that, yeah, actually Project 2025 is the agenda, LOL. Is a far right pol policy plan to overhaul the federal government imminent? Oh yeah, it's gonna, and, and of course, we've, we've heard uh, recently about the, uh, the appointment of the new attorney general that Trump has chosen, Matt Gaetz, uh, and, we're, and we've seen the, uh, uh, the czar that he's put in charge of immigration. We are going to see on day one a massive change in the way that the government deals with immigrants in the United States, and I don't think people yet fully understand what is about to happen, uh, but they will uh, uh, come January 20th because there is going to be a complete redirection of the government to rounding up and expelling people from the country. And of course, as I've mentioned frequently, this is not the first time. <laughs> you know, back in the 1950s, there was Operation Wetback under uh, President Eisenhower that deported about 350,000 uh, Mexicans. In the 30s, uh, Herbert Hoover did a massive deportation uh, program that up to a million, uh, largely Mexicans, were rounded up and deported from the country. Uh, you had under George Bush the massive workplace raids that occurred after the 2006 immigration protests, and under Barack Obama, the, the, who was labeled at one point deporter in chief, although those deportations were basically people who were coming out of uh, uh, court cases or out of prison and were just put on planes and shipped out of the country, about 400,000 a year. But this is going to be the biggest of them all, and I, and I think the, uh, we're going to see how the faith community deals with this. We're going to have to see how the, the different states that are much more progressive deal with this, and of course how the universities deal with this, because a lot of the universities have undocumented students uh, that are attending the, the, the Dreamers, and they're going to try to have to figure out how they're going to respond to the federal government's uh, uh, crackdown. Juan Gonzalez, thank you so very much for your time and for your insights. Oh, thank you. Thank you.